Eric Jacob. I'm the chief medical editor of Hemonc today, and I'm delighted to have sitting next to me uh, Dr. Keith Sullivan, uh, who's professor of uh, internal medicine at Duke University and a uh, member of the Division of Cellular uh, Therapy uh, and Bone Marrow Transplantation at, uh, at Duke. Um, as many of you know, Dr. Sullivan has been one of the real pioneers in, in bone marrow uh, transplantation and is going to uh, tell us a bit about the uh, Chinese menu, as he puts it, uh, choices that we now have uh, in uh, providing hematopoietic stem cell uh, uh, therapy to various uh, uh, patients and uh, how to look at that menu with some rationality uh, in uh, uh, suggesting and advising patients as to what kind of therapy is uh, going to be most useful and least toxic uh, for those patients. Keith? Thanks, Dr. Jacobs. Um, the, the menu is pretty straightforward. You had a, <laughs> pretty much a fixed um, repertoire of um, a standard preparatory regimen for transplant. Uh, 20 years ago it was an ablative regimen. You had a standard type of donor. It was a HLA identical sibling and you had a standard uh, source of stem cells. It was uh, bone marrow. And transplantation, and now many units are calling this actually cellular therapy, has evolved and reinvented itself as new sources of hepato hematopoietic stem cells have become available as new preparative regimens have become available and established and effective. that has opened up then not only the availability of the, of the technology, but uh, has pushed back uh, areas of what are uh, the diseases that can be approached by this. And so now we have uh, stem cell sources that can be marrow or peripheral blood or umbilical cord blood cells. We have marrow uh, or stem cell sources from siblings or unrelated donors or autologous self uh, donors with uh, manipulated products or ablative, uh, myeloablative or reduced intensity or even now uh, truly non-myeloablative regimens. And these then allow us to take um, the different components, a best match of the regimen of the source of stem cells and the donor HLA matching that would, could then be tailored to the patient's disease and um, age. I think this is important because our population is aging and uh, the patients that uh, are being considered for, non for malignant diseases are increasing in their age. Let me ask, how old are patients now that are being uh provided with bone marrow or stem cell transplantation. Uh, I can recall when I was the cutoff of 50 years, or maybe even 45, when you folk first started. Where are we now? How old, a person, uh, how old can a person be and get a transplant? And is that part of your Some, choice of Chinese medicine? Absolutely. Some have uh, actually joked that as the faculty have aged, <laughs> the uh, upper limit of age for patients has increased. But I think that uh, we are performing transplants, both autologous and allogeneic transplants, in individuals in the late 50s, 60s, and even early 70s, and we would never have considered that uh, 10 and 20 years ago. I think it's important because the repertoire of malignant diseases that are indications for transplant, acute myeloid leukemia, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, myeloma, these uh, CMLs uh, or myeloproliferative diseases, these are diseases that increase with age. And so as we have healthy individuals who are expected to live in their 70s, 80s, 90s, now we have real choices about transplant for an individual who is in their late 60s. What about transplants uh, for patients with non-malignant diseases, I'm thinking of the interest some years ago in some of the autoimmune, catastrophic autoimmune processes in which one totally tried to change their immunologic makeup so they stopped destroying themselves. What's going on with that? Well, I think that there's a, there is um, not only uh, a good literature base from preclinical and phase two clinical trials, but now finally there are pivotal phase three comparative trials to look at the efficacy as well as the toxicity. These are uh, being carried out in Europe 
as well as in the United States, and a variety of funding agencies, not only just the NHLBIs and the NCIs, but NIAID and others really are behind this to kind of get to the question, can we re-manipulate re the immune system and turn off an otherwise um, morbid and mortal disease, such as scleroderma or lupus? Well, speaking of scleroderma, uh, what about the long-term uh, problems that patients who have undergone successful, quote, successful acute bone mar uh, stem cell transplantation, uh, what kind of problems are they getting into and are we making any uh, uh, advances in, mm -hmm. in, in, in stopping things like the terrible skin disease of chronic mm -hmm. crap or so, which looks almost identical, probably sure. is, to scleroderma? Sure. And I think, again, that's donor matching because many of the times in the early years with um, unrelated donors, uh, we can now do 12 of 12 matches and fine-tune uh, the best of several available donors. And that will drive down rates of acute and chronic graft versus host disease. We have better pro prophylaxis regimens with calcineurians and other modalities. And importantly, we're, I think we're learning really for the first time how some of the dogmas that we thought that this was, oh, this has got to be a T-cell mediated disease and therefore we will do this, this, and this. We now, we now know that some of these disorders, chronic GVHD, may respond to anti-B cell therapy. It may respond to anti-TNF therapy. And so our knowledge, although it's still incomplete, we're starting to kind of push the envelope of what is effective treatment and I think we're getting there.